Welcome back to Coast 217 Lecture. In the second part of this lecture, we're going to work through a simple example of using GDB with ARM assembly language programs just to see some of the features and idioms that you will find useful in debugging your programs for assignments 5 and 6. Like in assignment 5, we're going to have a program that has a mixture of .c and .s source files. The C code is a simple little uh, function driver program that reads in a size, allocates a string of that size, initializes every character in the string to the character A, except for the very last one, which is the null byte. And then it calls our strlen function, which is custom written for us. Uh, you'll see that it's capitalized differently than the standard library. Um, so our, our strlen function, not shown in this file, when it gets a result back from the return value from strlen, it prints that out, and then it's done. So let's take a look at that strlen implementation. So our strlen implementation is written natively in assembly language code, so this is the text section. We have two semantically meaningful constants. We have min stack for the, um, the minimum possible amount of uh, space we can allocate for a stack frame. And um, we have i, which is 8. And so i here is going to be an offset from the stack pointer where we're storing the index variable uh, for, for indexing into our array. We announce that strlen is global. That means that it's visible in other files. Again, it darn well better be because main lives in another file. And then we say, OK, now we're ready to begin strlen. We set up our stack. And the first thing we do after the prologue is we're going to store uh, XZR, so that is the zero register. We're going to store its value, which is naturally zero, into SP comma I. So we're treating SP comma I, that is SP plus I as a pointer. Um, and so this is, we're storing it eight bytes from the, from the top of the stack. Um, at the top of the stack, we stored X30, so this is the next variable down. We then load from the location of x0. Now x0 here was passed in the string. So we've passed in the, the address of the string into the function that's in x0. And so we're going to load from that address a single byte storing it into w2, the lowest byte of w2, the lowest byte of the, the uh, x2 register. Then we're going to enter a loop. We, we announce the loop. We say um, compare w2 with the uh, zero register. If they're equal, we're done. That is to say, if we looked into the string and saw the null byte, we're done. We have finished counting all of the characters in the, in the string. Otherwise, we're going to load the value uh, that we stored into i um, back into uh, x1. We're going to add 1 to that and then store it back into the variable i. So here we're fully using i, uh, the memory location that i is stored in, as the variable i. We're not using it in any temporary registers or anything like that. This isn't necessarily the most efficient. We'll see that later. But this is a very thoroughly faithful, perhaps too faithful, unidiomatic uh, assembly language um, version of the string length algorithm that um, we, we came to know in assignment 2. At that point now, we can go and say, use this new value of x1, which we know is the index, and x0. We will add the, the byte offset of um, the index to x0, which was the, um, the pointer to the beginning of the string. And we will go to memory and fetch from that, uh, that location in memory the, um, the character there in the string and put it into w2. And then we unconditionally branch back to the top of the loop to make our comparison again to see if we found the null byte. Once we eventually do find the null byte, we come back down to the end and we will say, go get the value of i. Put it in x0 because this is our result. The index of the null byte is the length of the string. We then do our epilogue destroy our stack, uh, do our epilogue, which um, re uh, returns the return register to its original value, uh, restores x30, and then we destroy our stack, and we return. 
So let's walk through this program in GDB. Here's our build command that we have built it from our, our previously compiled .o of the driver, which was um, compiled with optimization turned on, and then our uh, str.s, the, the source file in assembly. So we're going to launch GDB just as we have been. And at this point, um, we're, we're going to see a lot of the same commands that we have before, but with a, perhaps a new take um, in assembly. So let's get started. So the first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll just break on Sterlen. So that says we're going to go directly to the Sterlen function and stop there. Now we'll run the program. Initially, it looks like it's hanging here, but it's actually just waiting. If you recall correct, if you recall, uh, the main function um, actually prompts the user for input to say how big a string do you want. So we'll take a nice small one here and, and just say 10. And at this point now, um, uh, GDB opens up and we see that we have uh, two screens. Uh, within our Emac window, we have the GDB uh, interface, and then we also have um, the code sitting there. Initially, it comes top and bottom. Um, if you've grabbed my uh, .emacs file, you'll see that we have um, transpose split. There we go. And so transpose split will make it instead of top and bottom, it'll make it side and side while keeping all of the same window contents. All right, so um, I personally kind of prefer it side by side, but up to you. All right, so we've dropped into here, and the first thing we want to say is, well, normally we want to look at our variables, but in assembly language, well, what do we have? We do had we we did have variables in the context of main, but in our assembly language uh, code, this portion, we're going to use registers and we're going to use memory. So let's see how we can do that. We can use the command info registers that will show us each of the registers in the running process. So we see the value of x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, and some of them have utterly garbage values. x0 has this 0x430010. That looks like an address, and indeed it should be an address because that's what's passed in, um, the address of the string. And you know, lots of other um, registers including the stack pointer and the program counter. So let's look at those quickly. Um, the stack pointer, we need to print dollar sign SP. So when we're printing out registers, we always need to do the dollar sign before their name. And when we print it, we get that. And again, this looks like an address, but not particularly useful. Um, but we can at least check and uh, say, well, we know that given what that um, arrow says, we're about to change the stack pointer. So let's do a step. We'll step one instruction and print SP again. And indeed, it did change by 16 bytes. From B0 to A0, it, it decremented. Great. Um, so now that we've, we've done that, we should look and say, what's there? Now, we haven't put anything there yet, so we, we have no expectation that there's anything there, but let's just see what's there. We can examine what's in memory by uh, using the x command, x for examine. So um, a lot of this, you know, the, the p for print, the x for examine, is just like we saw in the previous demo of using GDB, but here we're going to use it in the context of registers. So here we see that um, it has... 00420018. We have no context for what that should or shouldn't be, but let's step one more time, execute this store of the x30, and see what happens. At this point, it did change, and we have 00400005f0 as the hex address, and we know it's an address because it's x30, but we don't really see it that much here. So let's see if we can find out a way to get, get more information about this. So let's look at the, the help for the x command. Um, and we can see that uh, x can take as an option a format. And so the format can be, it can be an octal or hex or decimal or unsigned or all kinds of things, including it can be an address, a, or an instruction, i. 
So we know this is an address. Let's take a look at it that way. So we can do um, x of a of still the stack pointer. And now this makes a little bit more sense. This says, OK, the hex uh, address 4005F0 is at main plus 96. So it's 96 bytes beyond the, the start of the main function. This seems vaguely believable um, in the sense that we've done some things in main. And then after a while, after we set up our array, we invoked this, uh, we, we called this function. And so when we return from this function, we'll go back to a spot in main. This makes sense. We could actually look and see uh, more closely. We can actually look at that and say, if we take uh, that address, we can say, examine as an instruction, what's that? Hex that. And we can see that it's some sort of uh, instruction that we're not personally familiar with, but it seems plausible. Um, we can actually do one better, if you will. We can say, uh, you know, let's see if this is really sort of what we're expecting. We can give an argument that says a count of how many. So now I start to say, OK, I, I have some weird SXTW that we don't know about, and then an ADR, and then we're doing adds. We're working with x0. That's the type of thing that we would do when we come back from a function. And then we have a bl to, uh, to printf, which we know we call immediately after getting back from this function. So this is looking good. This seems like, in fact, we have stored x30, and that value that we stored on the stack is, in fact, a location in main where we will return to after this function. So that's where we're going to eventually. But where are we going immediately? Well, that's what the program counter is for. The program counter is the address of our next instruction. And um, so we see that that's sterlin plus 8. Kind of makes sense. We've, we've stepped a couple of times. Um, and so uh, after we've done two steps, the next thing we're going to do is 8 bytes beyond. We haven't talked about it yet, but each of the instructions in assembly is, uh, is 4 bytes. And so this is going to make perfect sense. All right, so let's see what's actually there. Just like with um, what we were just doing before, we can do the exact same thing. We can say uh, x slash i of the PC. And we get that the next thing is going to be a, a store from xcr into sp plus 8. And we already knew that. We can see that on the other side of the window. Um, but this is a way that if you're not uh, comfortable using Emacs, but you still want to use GDB, you can invoke GDB from the command line and get the exact same information just like this. All right. Um, so we did something else here. We, um, we're, we're going to step one more time. And now we have done a store into SP plus 8. So let's see what's there. Let's make sure that we actually stored 0 there. And so we can do that. Um, when we looked up, uh, you can see it just at the top of the screen here. When we see in the x, uh, the size letters are b for byte, h for half word, w for word, and g for giant, which is 8 bytes. We stored. 0 into SPI, uh, um, and that was supposed to be an 8-byte register. We used XZR. So this should have 0 in it if we go to uh, SP plus 8. So let's take a look. We're going to examine. We want to examine 8 bytes at a time. SP plus 8. And in fact, we do get 0. All right. Um, so that was displaying it once. One could imagine that this is something we're gonna, going to want to display over and over and over again. And so we can use the display command to, uh, to continually display memory uh, or to, to continually display registers. So the types of things that we're looking at in this program, if you look at the line that we're on right now um, where we're loading into W2, W2, clearly going to be an important uh, variable for us or register for us. So we can use display. Um, w2, and that uh, looks great. Um, and then we can say we want to, if we're looking at, okay, uh, the x1, again, going to be an important thing, so display x1. We haven't actually used x1 yet, so it's not going to be very interesting right now, but actually, um, hey, it has some value that might be useful. All right, and so now the, um, the last thing we want to do is, is recreate that, that x command uh, where we're examining. 
Unfortunately, their display doesn't take this idea of uh, memory location. There's no, uh, you know, from P prints it once to display prints it many times. There's no equivalent for X. But we can treat um, the, the arguments that we give to X, these effectively pointers that we're saying follow the arrow and go examine the memory, we can actually treat them that way and dereference them right there, then and there in a, in a display command. So let's try it out. If we try to just do display star sp plus 8, that's not going to actually let it uh, let us do it because uh, sp is, a, is, is treated like a void star. Um, so it showed it that um, it's just not going to let us do it. So we have to do a cast, just like if we want to work with a void star and dereference it in C. Same thing here in GDB. So we can do display. Um, instantly we can undisplay 3. Um, that's, you know, a little bit nicer. Um, so we can display star, so that's our dereference, unsigned long star. So this is a pointer to an unsigned long. Why unsigned long? Well, because in the C code, this was a size T. On our system, a size T is an unsigned long. So here we have it, and it's SP plus 8. Now, if I, I, if I do it correctly, it will actually give me, hey, this is the location that you wanted, which is zero. So we've done some displays. We'll undisplay four, because that wasn't what we wanted. So now let's, we, let's do one more step. So we have W2 is the value 97. X1 is the value 97. And the, um, the value of I is zero. So W2, not equal to uh, zero, so this comparison should not end up branching. We step twice, and indeed it doesn't. So now we can go back and load from X1. We do the add. You'll see that the X1 value changes. We store back into the, uh, the value I in memory. And you can see now that the value uh, at the offset 8 from SP changes. And now we're going to be ready to do our next time through the loop. So we, uh, we started with a priming read with um, uh, getting from X0 uh, into W2. Now we're going to get from X0 comma X1. So now we're saying take the base uh, location of the array and add our index to it. And that is the, uh, the location we want to get. We do that. Hey, look, it's another uh, 97. That's because we put A's into all of these. Incidentally, we could have done something a little bit slicker here. Instead of uh, doing uh, just display of W2, we could do display slash C, just like with the, um, the print or the X command, the display command can take a format uh, specifier and now we'll actually see that, yeah, this is the, the, the ASCII value of the character lowercase a, which is what we know we have in the string. All right. Um, if you uh, want to do some, some more work, we can certainly look and say, oh, we, we had this x0 comma x1. So this was the address of the current element of the array. We could certainly print that. And you know, we get some address. Um, perhaps it would be colloquially uh, uh, more common or uh, more idiomatic to do pr uh, print as a hex address, as an address, or print hex. Um, and you know, we get a hex address, but it doesn't actually matter to us. But if we wanted to know what's actually there, we could do the same trick we did with SP. So we could do um, display as a character the dereference of this is now a pointer to a char we're thinking of it as because there's actually characters there in the array of dollar uh, sign x0 plus dollar sign x1 and so there we get and say hey right here at this location is the character a and it will continue to be for a while um so at this point we can you know continue stepping and things are looking great but we sort of realize that as we step through, what we're really interested in is when W2 ceases to be A and becomes the null byte. And so when we're sitting here, we could say, okay, I want to step more than one at a time. So I can count and say, okay, what if I step seven? 
ah, that's convenient. I can step seven, and now you'll see that my, my index is incrementing each time. Um, so that's going pretty well. The um, uh, That would be great, but maybe we don't want to do that calculation. Um, maybe... Uh, if we if we don't want to either count or it's and we're just not sure of exactly how that would work, uh, we could always do set a new breakpoint. So we could set a breakpoint on this is on line um, 18, and um, uh, here on line 18 we could set a breakpoint and say, okay, now we know how to do it. We'll continue going through there. Everything would be good. But that would still say this only works if we know that it's always on exactly this line that we're going to uh, do our excess. What if we wanted to check every time that we uh, that we change the value of w2? Well, just like there's a breakpoint for when you reach a line in code, there are also watch points. So watch points say every time I, I change this variable, and there are exact details for every time I read it, every time I... I uh, access it at all every time I write it. So um, for now I'm just going to do the standard just watch. And I can do watch uh, dollar sign w2. And now I can just, just like with a breakpoint where I can just do continue, I continue through and um, it will go all the way until its value is changed. Now this is tricky because we changed it a whole bunch of times, but we overwrote it with itself every time. We, we didn't change the value, we just did a write of the exact same value into it. So it won't actually trigger until it finally changes value. Not that it was written to, but it actually changes. In this case, that's great. That's exactly what we wanted. Um, we can see now we, we have stopped. Um, it shows us the old value and the new value of this, of this uh, value that was being watched. All right, um, there were a number of other things that we can do. Uh, so uh, we could have, instead of doing that, we could have done the, uh, the breakpoint and said, show me the breakpoint, and we know it's a whole bunch of steps. So you've seen continue. Uh, perhaps you didn't know that you can give an argument to continue. You can say continue 10, and that says skip a whole bunch of continues. Skip, uh, do a continue. Oh, you hit a breakpoint, skip it. Um, until you hit, you, you reach that counter, at which point it will start actually being a breakpoint again. So this is convenient. If we had um, a, a gigantic um, array and we were stepping through, you know, one time each uh, loop and using the breakpoint instead of the watch point for the change, this would be super handy. We could say, okay, just, you know, continue 99 times. Then I'm going to be at the, the interesting point that I care about. But we can actually do this without knowing the number of executions. So um, we can add some conditional to um, to uh, existing um, breakpoint or or uh, watchpoint, and so that's with the condition command. Um, so uh, that would just be condition the number of the existing breakpoint or watchpoint. Um, so in this case, we could do uh, the, the watch point 2, and we want to wait you know, until w2 equal equals 0. Now, in this case, not very useful. It's already 0, um, and because it has the same value, 97, 97, 97, 97, a whole bunch of times, and then eventually becomes 0, that wouldn't be that useful here. However, we can do this without a watch point at all. We can actually do this with a breakpoint. So let me reset... Um, Um, so we can do info breakpoints and info watchpoints, and it uh, gives you information about what it is. Is it conditional? Um, so you can see there that it's a watchpoint. Uh, it's looking at W2. We stop only if it's equal to zero, and we've hit it one time. Uh, the breakpoint is uh, in just the, the Sterling function. We've hit it one time. All right, so we've uh, turned off uh, watchpoint 2. It's not there. So let's restart and see what happens. We can do it even a little bit slicker. So we can do a run. And yes, we want to start from the beginning. Um, we'll start. We'll get this same thing of, you know, let's say a big number now. And so now we stop here at the very beginning of the uh, function. And so now I say, aha, 
I'm interested in um, this line over here, this uh, uh, break on line uh, 19 or 18 or 19 as uh, the case may be. Um, and uh, I want to break there as soon as W2 becomes zero. So I can do break on line 19 if W2 equal equals zero. So now let's continue. We continue. It ran for a while there, and now you can see that we have hit it where um, the, the index, our x1 value, is 1,000. The uh, index in memory at sp plus 8, 1,000. W2 is now 0, and the thing that we're actually looking at, the, the actual memory location in the string, is the null byte. So I think that's a super useful tool of, um, as you're starting to look, especially at this next assignment where you will potentially want to run it for many, many iterations, there are a couple of examples of how you can, uh, either with continuing with an argument or setting a watch point or setting a breakpoint that's conditional, uh, go through and, and get the behavior you want to trigger and, and stop and allow you to look at the, um, the, the state of the program when some particular condition hits. All right, so that was our brief tour of GDB. Um, the last thing I'd like to talk about in this portion of the lecture is just some, uh, some more discussion of optimizations, because that's really what's at the core of the part two of, assignments, uh, of assignment five. So we're going to um, quit out of that. And now um, we, we have our, our handy little stir.s. Let's copy it over into uh, stirop.s. And let's think about what optimizations could we make. Before we do that, let's go ahead and just see how long does this take. So um, I'm going to echo a large number into stirlens. So that's going to, uh, it's going to ask me you know, how, how many times do you want it, and let's do it. So we run it. Um, this was compiled with uh, optimization turned on of the stirlen, but not of that assembly because we just wrote it. And that's a big number, and it took four seconds. So the question is, can we do better? Um, you might naturally think, well, you could have compiled with optimization there. OK, so let's come back up. Um, we'll talk more about optimization in the next lecture, but you know, just for now, we'll try it again. And you can see that you know, minus 03, not getting us anything when it's already compiled the sterlin.o and our hand-coded assembly, no, no big benefit. The compiler, assembly, uh, the compiler optimization isn't going to help when we aren't running the compiler on our assembly. We're just assembling it and then linking it. All right, so let's look at our code and see um, if we have uh, some, some natural things that we might want to do. So the thing we talked about last time was memory very slow. We should use registers. Here, um, there's we, we certainly could use Kali saved registers, but I'm going to just use some of the registers that are caller saved for simplicity, so I don't have to um, uh, uh, save them away, store them away, and restore them. Um, and also because, as it ends up, I'm not calling any functions here, so I have no worries about having to uh, have them be destroyed by some function call. So instead of memory, we're going to use registers. And the other thing is... Um, each time here, I'm, I'm adding an index, and then I have to recompute the location in the array, so I have to do another add. If I was using this as more of like the equivalent of strp instead of stra from assignment 2, using pointers, I think that we could potentially save an operation or two. Will it make a huge difference? Who knows? But um, at least it would be... Uh, a little bit cleaner rather than having the all of this stuff going on with the index to just think of this as a pointer operation as we walk down the array. So um, let's uh, first concentrate on getting rid of all of these memory addresses. So uh, we have uh, store zero into the memory. Nope, that's not going to be a thing anymore. Instead, we're going to uh, say, OK, x1 is going to be our um, our pointer. So let's do move 
uh, into x1 from x0. x0 is the base pointer of the, the array, so let's move into x1. Um, for consistency in our array, we're going to be uh, loading from wherever x1 points, so that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll change it here, even though they're in fact the same value. All right, in our loop, we still do a comparison. At this point, though, we, we are not going to do a, uh, a load from um, sp comma i. We're going to um, uh, just add one to the uh, to the x one, which is serving as our index. So that's fine. We still do need to do a load though, because we need to load the actual value. But here, instead of being x0 plus x1, x1 is the pointer to the current character in the array. So we can just do load from x1 into w2. All right, so then we branch. Um, after, the, uh, uh, after the entire loop goes around, um, instead of going out to memory and grabbing from i, we're just going to uh, subtract the two pointers. We're going to say, where are we now, minus the base, and that's the number of, uh, of characters that we're in between. So we're going to do a sub uh, from, uh, store it into x0, because that's going to be the return address from x1, x0. So we're saying x1 minus x0, the current location minus the original location. We restore, and everything looks good. So let's see what happens at this point. So we're going to look for stir opt and let's run it already a significant difference um, I should be running these multiple times so I can tell you that the the um, stir land has consistently been between 4.40 and 4.45 seconds and uh, stir land opt here consistently is right at 2.91, uh, you know, give or take, literally hundreds, um, or even thousands. So, um, so we've done that. This seems great so far. Um, can we do more? So the idea in assignment five is really about being creative, looking at all of the things that you could imagine doing. And so I mentioned earlier that we're not actually making any function calls. If we're not making any function calls, we don't actually need a stack, and we don't actually need to restore x30 because we've never changed x30. We've taken away all of the memory accesses, so i isn't on the stack. We um, aren't making any function calls, so x30 doesn't need to be on the stack. We can actually take those away altogether. Would we expect that this is going to make a huge difference? Frankly, no, because it's a single thing at the top and at the bottom. Furthermore, this function is only called once. If this function were being called over and over and over and over again, this would potentially be a big win. But right now, yeah, sure, it might have helped us on the very margins, but probably not a huge win. That being said, we want to think about it creatively, and we can say, okay, we're comparing with zero. So every time we do this comparison with zero and then a branch for equality. But we know from a previous lecture that there is this compare with the value zero. And so I don't know if it's faster or not. Let's try. I could imagine it might be only because we don't have to do with two separate uh, instructions. It's all wrapped into one. But again, it's experimental. We really don't know until we try it. We can think about it. We can pontificate. We can read all of manuals in, a, in the world. But when it comes down to it, when we're trying to optimize, especially in assignment five, try it out. See if it helps or not. If it helps in your code, keep it there. If it doesn't, don't. So let's try it out. Um, instead of this comparison with W2 and WZR, um, we are going to uh, just do uh, compare uh, branch to zero. Um, the location we're going to is SL end, and the register we're comparing to see whether it's zero or not is W2. We'll rebuild it. We'll try it again. And it, again, made a pretty decent difference again. So didn't really know whether it would be beneficial or not, but as it ends up, yes, very much so. 
Um, you'll see in the, um, the Payet Nugeta book that they discuss a little bit about the um, loop structures, and you'll talk a little bit about this in Precept as well. So we can try that too. So when we look at our um, loop structure, we see that we do a conditional branch at the top of uh, the loop every time, and then at the bottom we do a, an unconditional branch. The problem with this is that each time through the loop we're going to do a branch and then immediately do another check. It would be nice if we could minimize that, if we could get that down to one check and potential uh, jump per, uh, per iteration through the loop. So the way we can do that is basically guard the loop. Instead of just having a, this is effectively a while loop, we could have an if statement outside and then a do while loop. So that way we could have the only check come at the very end of the loop. And we wouldn't need this jump back to the top. Let's see what that would look like. So before the loop, we can check um, if we're already at zero, if the very first uh, byte that we read in was, um, was zero, that's the empty string, immediately go to the end. Otherwise, well now we're going to go in and we know that the, uh, the precondition of this loop is satisfied. So we can come all the way down here and we'll just invert the condition here at the end and say if we are not at zero at this point, go back up to the top of the loop. If we are at zero at this point, fall off the bottom. That's the equivalent of jumping to the end. We just go to the next instruction. So will this help or not? I don't know. Um, again, it's saving a little bit of logic, maybe increases pipelining a little bit, but really hard to judge. Let's be empirical about it and see. When we try it out, Maybe that's, you know, within the margin of error as it were, but um, if we try it again and if we get the exact same time again or very close, yeah, it seems like, again, that made some very small, very incremental difference. But enough small incremental differences with a couple of those big leaps, and suddenly you have a really efficient program that you certainly couldn't have done just by, um, uh, just by compiling. Um, the, the entire premise of this is that, yes, while it is true um, that the compilers are awesome, as I said in the first part of this video, we can in fact do much better than the compiler for certain tasks where either we know more about the uh, characteristics of the program, the characteristics of the workload, um, we're able to make use of instructions that the compiler might not know about or know that uh, they apply, and so it's really worthwhile to try and be creative when we uh, try to optimize. So that's the takeaway for the end of this. Um, again, I encourage you to uh, work hard on assignment five, get started. Um, you probably won't be to the part two F that I'm sort of implying with this uh, section for a while now, but the sooner that you get there, the better. Um, it certainly, if you're having fun with it, can take infinite amount of time. And if you're not having fun with it, you know, it's uh, still a small bit of a slog to get as many of the uh, optimizations as we suggest. So good luck with that.